I'm an engineer by training. Um, and uh, what, um, what I want to do with my presentation today, my objective is essentially to make a case for, um, for how the technologies, the digital technologies that we interact with during our daily lives, um, particularly wearable technologies, will fundamentally reshape our understanding of the science of health and, and our, our practice of healthcare. Um, so as an okay, this, sorry. Um, so as an engineer, if, if there are any doctors or clinicians in, in, the, in, the, in the room, um, you know, if I take any liberties with my interpretation of healthcare, please, please excuse, uh, excuse my, um, uh, my boldness, I guess. Um, so before, um, before we dive in, uh, I wanted to do a quick sort of mental exercise. Um, if I asked you to imagine, you know, or, or essentially create a snapshot in your mind of what your personal health healthcare experience looks like, um, what, what would that, you know, how, how would you sort of imagine it, right? Um, I'm, not, I'm not very good at computer graphics, so I asked Dali to come up with something for me. Um, and it actually, you know, this, this looks quite similar to what, you know, the way I experience healthcare in my own life. Um, maybe this looks a little bit more sophisticated, a little futuristic in terms of the setting. But, you know, generally speaking, this is, this is what my personal health ex healthcare experience looks like. Um, one thing that I wanted to particularly point here was these, um, uh, these tools, right? Uh, the stethoscope around, around the doctor's neck, um, these instruments that are hanging on the wall to, you know, investigate different organs and measure different aspects of our health, imaging technologies, uh, blood testing. So these are, these are all the different tools that we have used uh, for measuring our healthcare traditionally. And our science of health is largely based on um, health measured using these tools and interpreted you know, based on those measurements. And, um, and also, these measurements are typically made by uh, healthcare professionals in a clinical setting. So this, this model of healthcare, this approach to healthcare, has been quite, um, quite remarkable in terms of the impact that it has had on, on, on our lives, right? Um, we have, um, uh, you know, seen dramatic increases in, in our lifespans. Uh, we've also seen our quality of life improved because of the, the healthcare advances. So clearly, this, this approach has worked quite well. Um, here are a couple of charts um, that, that essentially highlight the, the, the improvement. So the, the chart on the... On the, on the left here shows the life expectancy from about you know, 1900s to 2021. And we can see that across the world, we see roughly a doubling or more than double doubling of the, the, the life expectancy. That's, that's quite remarkable um, over a you know, span of more than 100 years. Um, the chart on the, on the right uh, shows a similar view, but there is a little bit of a nuance here. Uh, on the x-axis, we have the cost um, or the healthcare expenditure. And what we see here is, is a sub subtle sign that we might be hitting somewhat of a wall in terms of driving outcomes. So what we are clearly seeing here, particularly you know, something that is exacerbated in, in the United States, is, is that our healthcare outcomes are not improving, you know, and we are spending, you know, as we spend more money uh, trying to, you know, uh, improve our health outcomes, right? Um, and so, I, you know, there are lots of challenges uh, that, we, that our healthcare system faces, and we, you know, I think this group particularly is probably thinking about those challenges on a daily basis as, as you work on, on different aspects of innovation. Um, the three challenges that I, want, I wanted to highlight are, are the ones that are rooted in how we, um, how we measure our health. And I shamelessly stole this, um, uh, this illustration from Evidation Health uh, because I think it does a really, really good job of articulating what, you know, what, you know, what these challenges are and how they manifest. So what we see here under this, under this time, um, the horizontal line that, that illustrates time, are these yellow bars that are showing essentially how our health evolves in the real world, what is happening on a daily basis. And you can see that there is a lot of granularity. There are lots of ups and downs. Our health sort of you know, evolves, changes. Um, and 
in terms of what we measure, what our healthcare is based on, is these snapshots, right? So we get these like episodic measurements that are happening uh, because you know we go to the for our annual physical, or we might get sick and we go to the doctor, and that's when these episodic measurements happen. And and then we apply these sort of population norms, like what 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 does health look like at a at a population level, and make decisions based on those population norms to to make, take actions on those, uh, on those health assessments. So what, what that leads to is, is this fundamentally reactive model where we are, um, we are you know, sort of typically sort of detecting things later in the game when we've, had, uh, when we've essentially lost a, a, a big chunk of opportunity to, to take preventative measures to, to improve you know, our, our health outcomes rather than waiting for a disease to develop and then try to treat it. So this model, um, it worked, I guess, quite well. And the model, I guess, was designed to, to, to address the challenges that we were facing several de decades ago around um, you know, dealing with in, uh, death and preventing death because of uh, infectious diseases or maternal inter infant, infant mortality or uh, things like trauma. Right? Those, I think we have done a really good job of solving for those. But the nature of the problem that we are, problems that we are trying to solve for today is fundamentally different than what we were solving for several decades ago. And we're essentially using the same model of, of, of healthcare to solve these new problems. So this, these two charts essentially you know, illustrate what, um, what are these problems, what, sort of like what are the, 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 the big challenges that we are, we are dealing with today. Um, so the chart on the left shows the number of deaths by risk factors, different health risk factors in the US. And it's probably a bit hard to read, but the top five are high blood pressure, smoking, um, high blood sugar, obesity, and uh, poor diet. Right? Um, the chart on the, on the uh, right shows the proportional contribution of different risk factors, so different, different, um, different factors associated with these, these um, sort of um, death and disease. And I think this is something that Felix um, uh, alluded to earlier, that the biggest factor that we are dealing with today is our behavior patterns, followed by genetic predisposition, and then healthcare, the quality of healthcare that we get, is accounts for only about 10% of, of uh, what drives our health outcomes. So this is quite remarkable. And so when we think about what is the right model of healthcare to use, to address these, these issues, I think we, we need to fundamentally change that to, um, to, to make healthcare more of a daily practice. And what we mean by daily practice is essentially you know, uh, a model or, or an approach to healthcare that is continuous, that is personalized, and that is focused on prevention rather than reacting to issues. And, Fundamentally speaking, this techno the technologies that are a part of our daily lives, whether, whether it's your smartphone or the wearable device that you're using, they're the, the primary instruments that we will have to capture um, information about our, of, about our health to make this connection between our daily lifestyles and behaviors and the impact that they have on, on our health and health outcomes. And the science that we need to do to, to underpin this new approach to healthcare you know, we'll have to invest time and effort in, in figuring out that science and building that science. The good news is that this science is already happening. The data that we need to drive this science and, and, and discover and develop this science is being collected as we speak. So I, I, I have a ring on my finger that is you know, capturing data as I speak right now about you know, how stressed I am or you know, what my physiology is, what my heart rate is, what my you know, temperature is, and that data is continuously be, being collected. So there's a real opportunity for us to mine this data to understand and develop this new science of health. And over the next six slides, I'm going to essentially share some examples of this science that has been done over the last few years that has led to some remarkable sort of insights and discoveries. Um, the interesting thing about all of these, uh, these, these um, uh, examples is, is that all of the, the uh, the science was developed based on data from the Oura Ring collected at, during night, so do, while you were sleeping. 
So the source of data is when people are sleeping, but, but um, in terms of the science that, that was developed, it, it spans across sleep, it's, uh, sleep, infectious diseases, and women's health. So the spectrum of, of um, health aspects that you can study uh, is, is really you know, infinite con considering the, the type of data that is being captured. So this first example is um, a study that was done by uh, researchers at National University of Singapore. Um, this was done during the, the pandemic. And the research question that they asked was, how does lockdown stringency affect sleep patterns and resting heart rate across countries? And you know, during the pandemic, we had public health decisions that were taken at, at, across different countries. And there was a big difference in, in the types of um, uh, lockdowns that were imposed across different countries. So this was a really interesting question. In order to answer this question, they uh, mined data from about 113,000 Aura users and across 20 countries. And what, what they found was, was quite remarkable and, and somewhat counterintuitive. So what they found across the board is, is, um, is that the mid-sleep, um, uh, the, the midpoint of your sleep was universally delayed. So people were going to bed later, uh, consistently across all the countries. Uh, but the mid-sleep variability, which indicates how, how your sleep schedule fluctuates from day to day, was lowered across the board as well. So basically meant that you, people were going to bed sleeper, but, uh, la sleep later, but they were also sleeping much more consistently. And that, from a physiological perspective, seems to have translated into a lower heart, resting heart rate uh, for people across the board. So this is quite fascinating, right? So you, you could articulate that, you know, on one hand, from a physiological perspective, this might, be look, this might look like, you know, um, the lockdowns were somewhat beneficial uh, for, for people in terms of their sleep schedule and, and their, phys their impact on their physiology. Another interesting thing was that um, the, the, the magnitude of, of impact was proportional to the stringency of lockdown. So the biggest impact was in Singapore, where they had the strictest lockdowns, and where you saw the, the biggest drop in you know, the resting heart rate and also uh, sleep variability across the day. So this was quite fascinating to understand uh, health impact through the lens of public policy. And, and sort of the secondary un un unintended effects of, of uh, public policy decisions. Uh, the second study, which was published just a couple of months back, um, was looking at how sociocultural factors contribute to sleep patterns across the countries. And this was a truly massive data set uh, with more than 220,000 Aura users uh, across 35 countries. And the total data set covered about 50 million nights um, and with an average of 242 nights per, per user. So this was truly like longitudinal, large-scale data. Um, one of the most remarkable findings from this study was that in Asia, um, across the board, the sleep, uh, people were sleeping, people are sleeping less. There is higher variability uh, of, of sleep. Um, and the, the sleep is of lower quality, so the efficiency is you know, efficiencies of sleep is poor during the weekdays. And so what you would expect is that in Asia, you might see that people are sleeping poorly during the week, but then they're trying to catch up during the weekend. Um, but what we found was that the, 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 uh, the sleep extension during the weekend was also lower compared to Europe or, or Americas, which essentially translated into um, indicating that the, 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 sleep, the quality of sleep that, that people in Asia are getting is generally of, you know, sort of less and, and, and has some really big implications in terms of public health and, and health outcomes that, that are the result of this to maybe perhaps some sociocultural aspects um, of, of what, you know, how um, perhaps around work or, or, or lifestyles. Um, now shifting gears, uh, a couple of studies that focused on infectious diseases. The first one uh, was looking at uh, physiological responses to, to vaccines, COVID infections, and, and also breakthrough infections post-vaccination. Post so this was a study that we did by looking at um, data from about 20,000 users who had entered a COVID-19 
vaccine tag in the Aura app. Um, about 800 users who also entered a confirmed COVID-19 tag, and 101 users had uh, breakthrough infection, so they had entered a COVID-19 tag after uh, they, had, they had gotten their COVID vaccine. So they, had, they also had a COVID vaccine tag. Um, what we found here was, um, uh, was that there was a strong response to vaccines uh, across temperature, heart rate, uh, respiration rate, heart rate variability, and sleep efficiency. Um, the vaccine response, the physiological response to vaccine was also 40% larger in younger uh, adults versus older adults, uh, which is also something that, that has been anecdotally kind of understood. Um, so it was good to sort of conf confirm that from, from data. Um, we also saw that the response was 80% larger to the second dose compared to, to the first dose. Um, the other uh, interesting finding here was that for people who did not have COVID vaccines uh, versus people who did have COVID vaccines, there was a, there was a big difference in, in terms of the, the severity of the response uh, when they got COVID. So you can clearly see that um, there was, you know, the, the, the severity of the physiological response and also the duration was significantly different between the two, the two groups, which essentially highlights the efficacy and the protective uh, aspect of, of vaccines. So this has interesting implications for both for how you would think about educate, like public education around vaccines and how vaccines work, um, and also perhaps uh, in, in terms of using wearable technology as a tool in the vaccine development process. Um, another study that, that uh, researchers at UCSF uh, recently published kind of dove a little bit deeper into, into this, uh, this question. And what they, the question that they asked was, is there a relationship between symptoms and biometric changes following COVID-19 vaccination and the level of, level of neutralizing antibodies um, that are developed. So essentially, uh, if you have a stronger physiological response, does that indicate, does that tell you something about the level of protection that you might get from, from vaccines? And what they found was quite remarkable. What, they, what you can see here from, from these charts is that the, there was a strong predictive effect of physiological changes uh, for the second dose for, for both the, month, the, the neutralizing antibody levels at month one and at, at month six. Um, and, you know, this is, this is an, another example of how um, this, this new science can help us inform uh, public policy decisions as well as, as, well as um, you know, the development of new, new, ther you know, new vaccines. Uh, the next two examples are focused on women's health. Uh, the first study was uh, focused on pregnancy and understanding the patterns, physiological patterns during, during pregnancy. Um, so the researcher, researchers at UCSD uh, d designed a retrospective study where they asked Aura users to enroll um, and contribute their data. And within about seven days, they had 1,200 uh, people who signed up to share data from their pregnancies. Um, from this data set, they pulled out data from 30, 30 people who had about 180 day, days of data around conception. And what they found from this uh, study was that uh, distal body temperature at night the, it has a significant change after conception. And you could detect pregnancy on an average about five and a half days after conception, which is nine days before an at-home test would confirm uh, confirmed pregnancy and about three weeks um, sooner than what you know most people in the U.S. when most people in the U.S. find out that they, they might be pregnant. Um, there was also some interesting insights about how temperature, the temperature signal, can be used to me measure and monitor uh, maternal and fetal health throughout the pregnancy. Um, the last example is about um, essentially kind of from a data point of view, validating the, the impact of, of physiology or sort of um, uh, the, the female physiology on, on variability of, of physiological data. Um, women have been traditionally uh, you know, excluded from clinical research uh, because of concerns around negative impacts on reproductive health, as well as uh, the belief that um, uh, uh, hormonal fluctuations during men menstrual cycle contribute to uh, sort of complicating the interpretation of the results. And um, 
And this has had a, had a big impact, or, or sort of like a, a big gap in our understanding of how drugs affect uh, women differently than men. Uh, we, we, we see that women are much more likely to have adverse drug reactions than men as, as, a, as, as one of the results of this. Um, and so the researchers wanted to understand from a data perspective, is there some truth to this aspect of female physiology being more variable than men, men's physiology? And so they pulled out this data set from 600 people, uh, 300 females and 300 age-matched males, uh, from a large uh, study called TemPredict, which had about 60, 65,000 uh, participants. Um, and when they analyzed the data, they found that if you look at the variability across days or even weeks and months, there was actually no statistical difference between you know, physiological variability between men and women. So from a variability perspective, male and female physiology was fairly identical. The difference was that uh, the female physiology had much more structured variants, which means that you had more you know, cyclical patterns associated with the menstrual cycle, which makes, makes the physiology easier to model and predict. And so one, you know, one uh, impact of this research is that uh, it essentially challenges sort of this long-held traditional belief that you know, female physiology adds more complexity and variability into clinical research data. And the second um, interesting uh, aspect of this is that it, it provides this sort of uh, identifies this opportunity for us to include um, physiology as a way to characterize some of the differences that we might be seeing and model that into, into, our, into our analysis. Uh, so, so take a, take a new uh, approach to um, interpreting the results of clinical research. So just to summarize, I think, I hope that these examples um, have articulated my, my case for, for, for why I believe that the data that we are capturing with wearable technology will fundamentally reshape our understanding of the science of health and also, as a result, uh, the practice of healthcare. Thank you.